I feel like she needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. She is a nine times gold medalist Paralympic wheelchair racer, 11 times gold medalist in the World Para Athletics Championships, and she's the coach for young wheelchair athletes. And over the top of this, she is currently coaching Tokyo 2020 Paralympic gold medalist Madison Di Rosario. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. You're listening to Have the Nerve. I'm Susan Wood, and I am very excited for this guest. For this episode, Louise Savage and I talk a little bit about disability, a little bit about her career, and a little bit about disability representation. And I think I'm confident enough to say that we've become firm friends now. Just saying. Let's start with growing up in Perth. And I think I've mentioned this to you before, and I think you and I actually have very similar paths of our disability. You were born with your disability. I was born with my disability. Could you just give a bit of background about what your disability is? Yeah, I was uh, born with my disability. It's basically where the, the base of my spinal cord didn't form properly. And unlike spina bifida, it was on the inside of my body. So I'm incomplete paraplegia, basically T11, T12 kind of area. And it's not. it doesn't have an official name. So I'm a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, um, arthrogryposis and, and, and a few other things going on. So I think the combination of everything doesn't actually have a, a full on title. So, but that's okay. I'm, you know, a bit of this, a bit of that. She'll be right. But there's a few diagnoses in there and they just all don't mush into one simple one, I suppose. Where you grew up in Western Australia, did you have people who had disabilities around you or were you the only one with a disability? When I was quite young, I probably didn't have many other children with disabilities, especially at school. I was the only child with a disability at my primary school. They were fantastic. They did a lot of renovations to the junior primary and um, it was all made very accessible for me and it was fantastic. They were very progressive, I, I would have thought, back then. But when I was about three or so, my mother did um, take me to swim lessons and they were for children with disabilities so that was I suppose my first interaction with other children with similar disabilities so that was fantastic um, obviously learned a lifelong skill my parents got to interact with other parents that had children with similar disabilities so a big learning curve for all of us but it wasn't until I was eight years old I was introduced into wheelchair sports and yeah life changed just a tad from there you mentioned that your school obviously made renovations for you and accommodated for you as best as possible. What did they actually do around the school to accommodate? Uh, the junior primary was um, was undergoing some renovations anyway and they knew that I was potentially going to come to the school. My, my older sister had been there and um, they didn't see any reason why they shouldn't make the school accessible for future generations as well so that they could um, accommodate more people with disabilities, especially um requiring mobility, um, you know, a wheelchair access more than anything. So um, with that in mind, they did um, renovate the, the junior primary. And then, of course, I went on to the senior junior primary, which sounds really weird. Um, and that was also um, accessible for me as well. So that was fantastic that they, they did that. And, you know, given the, the year that I went to school, that was um, actually really fantastic that they did that. And I'm pretty sure that it still stands today, you know, there's the renovations and there's ramps and things like that everywhere. So everyone has access to, to everything. So, yeah, I think that was fantastic in the day. Yeah, I mean, when you mention that it's there today and the long term accessibility complementing people for generations to come. Right. So that's really what it's about. And I guess that really uh, talks to forward thinking universal design, really. I mean, like you and myself, when we're going back to primary school, that was a while ago but it actually matters all the time rather than because that person is has a disability now, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, back when I started going to school, a lot of children with disabilities didn't integrate into the regular primary school. And my mother didn't even think that I couldn't go to the same school as, as my sister. So she didn't think that I should go to anywhere else but my local primary school. Go mum for being, you know, I suppose progressive as well. My, my high school was chosen though because um, it was accessible and that I had options there. I went to a massive high school and yeah, there was a lot of other kids with disabilities and it wasn't unusual. And it, I think that was probably one of the best things is because, you know, kids grew up with other the kids that were had disabilities in the primary school and the high school and you know when they got older they didn't think anything different of it either and I think that's fantastic that's the way it should be. 
you were introduced to wheelchair uh, racing at the age of eight. What sort of aspirations did you actually have growing up for what you wanted to be? Was it along those lines? Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I think when I was introduced into wheelchair sports, I did a number of different things. I did wheelchair racing. I did the field events. I did swimming, uh, which was my first love. I did basketball. I did so many things that as any child, you know, kind of experiments with sport, you know, you go and see what you like and what your friends are doing and, you know, what's fun. And so, yeah, I, I enjoyed it so much. Um, you know, I think anyone who knows me, you know, I'm slightly competitive. So, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun and I loved to see what I could do. But I never dreamed of, I didn't even know what the Paralympics were or anything. I never dreamed of representing Australia or anything like that. I think all these ideas were put into my head by my coach. And, you know, you could represent your state. You could go on to nationals and, you know, who knows, you know, kind of thing. And I'm like, okay, radio, you know, I'm just having fun. This is good, you know, seeing how good I could get in Australia. And then, um, you know, then after that, I think he really saw the potential in myself, which I had no idea about. And, you know, he was probably one of the best mentors that I could have had, you know, what the future could hold for me. So he knew uh, I just had no clue at the time. <laughs> at what point do you say, yeah, I want to actually do this as a career choice? Uh, I think after my first world championships, um, you know, opposite, obviously representing Australia and I got to see what my sport was a bit about. And I thought, nah, this is this is what I want to be part of. This looks like an awesome world and um, you know, of course you know I came home with these massive aspirations that I was going to be a professional athlete and all that kind of thing although no one had ever done it with you know an athlete with a disability or female athlete or a, potentially in my sport that you know none of that really got a lot of coverage or sponsorship or anything like that but no no that's what I wanted to do. Yeah it was probably in the early 90s. So you were basically the f- were you the first? Because you said they didn't they didn't really f- consider females Paralympians in your specific sport. So this was obviously groundbreaking for them. I think there was a I was probably one of the only Paralympic athletes to to gain corporate sponsorship and become professional at a very um, early age and to be able to compete um, not only at a Paralympic level and world championship levels on the track but able to branch out into road races which is where I could make some money in prize money it was massive overseas um, and that was probably how I became more professional than anything and it wasn't until the games um, obviously we're going to be here in Australia in Sydney in 2000 that I gained corporate backing, um, which was fantastic. I'd had my most successful Paralympics in 96, winning four gold, but didn't really gain any corporate sponsorship or anything after that. It was only because the Games were going to be here that people kind of started getting on board, I think, more and saw the viability in athletes with disabilities and myself and took the chance and I was very grateful for that. I was one of those athletes sponsored that had a disability. And so I was part of a few groups of athletes that were sponsored by corporates, the only athlete with a disability. So I was very grateful at the time and thought, wow, this is fantastic. And hopefully that paved the way. And I, um, it's kind of cool to see what it is now and that athletes are getting sponsored and they're seeing the viability and the marketability and and seeing the value in them. And I just think that's phenomenal. And I'm so grateful to be a part of that and maybe pave the way just a little bit. And I just want to see it get, you know, even bigger and better and, and hopefully, you know, see those athletes even excel even more, not in their own sporting endeavours, but, you know, physically and mentally and to see what they can do outside of their sporting realm, you know, be given this platform to do it. And, you know, I've had this massive platform, so it's been fantastic. and. It's changed my life and, you know, for the better. When you were saying that more Paralympic athletes have more recognition, and I don't know if it's just the algorithm within my Instagram, you, you coach Madison Di Rosario, and she has recently had some, doing some advertisements for The Body Shop. And that's something that... Is, is actually quite different. And over the course of the number of decades between you being a, a Paralympian who didn't get any sponsorship in 96 to now, the person you're coaching now is being approached by massive brands to represent them. It's great. It's fantastic. I mean, Madison is associated with a number of high-profile brands, uh, internationally and Australian. And yeah, I, I 
congratulate her. She's done well and, you know, obviously being very successful at her sport helps, but she's a very attractive person as well. And But um, she wouldn't have got any of that unless she was, you know, good at her sport more than anything. And fantastic, as I said, to, that, that everyone's seeing the value in it and that what they can get out of it. What sort of funding opportunities were you given or what would you have to do to try and get to the Paralympics um, even 96 Paralympics? At the very beginning, um, obviously we had to support ourselves to get to World Championships and Paralympics. Um, but I've been very lucky because it was probably around the time where they started getting more funding for athletes and more funding in terms of for Paralympic Games more than anything. So I haven't necessarily had to fund too much to get to a Paralympics, which is fantastic. Um, but definitely World Champs and a whole bunch of other competitions that we've fundraised in the past to get there and equipment. Um, my sport is a very expensive sport. So we've done a lot of fundraising and, you know, had a lot of local support and Lions clubs and rotaries and, and grants and all kinds of things to, to get you know to get to where you are so it's it does take a village I suppose and a lot of community support to to get you started it's part of what I do now is try and give back to the sport that gave me so much you know there's a lot of kids out there that want to get involved and it's very expensive and it's it's very hard for a lot of parents because um, a lot of kids with disabilities need specialized equipment so to participate and it just to have a go and and have fun and be with their friends you know who knows what dreams they actually do make come true for a lot of kids for me it was you know representing Australia and and going on to uh, lots of different heights I suppose so yeah the the fundraising component is very important there might be people out there who are really who don't even know that a wheelchair standard day a wheelchair which um is just an everyday wheelchair for people can cost upwards of twenty thousand dollars I can't imagine the cost it would be to have um all your equipment to need to have with you to take to the Paralympics. So what what sort of what sort of costs are we actually looking at? Um, a race chair, a standard race chair is probably between oh, by the time you get it into Australia, we're almost up to ten grand. Um, and then depending on what wheels you put on it, like this um, carbon fiber wheels and things like that, they can cost you know between three and four thousand dollars as well, depending if you get a good deal and you can get them into Australia. <laughs> but there's ongoing stuff like the you know the tires, the wheels, the gloves, the helmets. Um, you know, there's there's so many different things that that you know are ongoing with our sport. I know just heading to the Paralympics, we will be taking um, Madison will be taking her race chair, obviously a couple of sets of wheels um, for the front and the back, um, a lot of different spare parts and helmets and yeah, there's just so many different things that you know she gets to she has to take with her. So it's um it's quite expensive with the program that I run on a Saturday morning and people for come and try. We recycle everything, recycling old chairs and that are still good and things like that. So we do a lot of that and a lot of the, the elite guys will, will give up their gear when it's, you know, they're done with it, but it's still got some life in it so that they can help future generations because they know how expensive it was for them to get into the sport. So it's a great community the spirit that way. Going back to you in the 2000 Paralympics, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, but um, it was actually the first time I think I really took notice of the Paralympics itself. Um, and that's not just because, oh, it might have actually been because it was in Sydney and we're all in Sydney, but it was the first time that I noticed a Paralympian who was female. I remember in the 1996 Paralympics, your name was brought up to me a couple of times. Everybody got excited, but in the 2000s was the time where I actually noticed you. It was just a really unusual moment because it was almost like the first time I was seeing a reflection of myself. I could only imagine that, obviously, we've talked about representation and the importance of representation for everybody, really. But what was the flow-on effect from, did you notice any change for people who were perceiving Paralympic sports and Paralympians in general? Yeah, definitely. The, having the Games in Australia obviously highlighted so many different things, not just athletes with disabilities, but people with disabilities in general. It was a massive celebration. What a massive platform to have. Okay, it's sports central, but you know, it, it didn't matter what it was. As long as we got the attention and people with disabilities were highlighted for their ability 
and what they could actually do and their competitiveness and the sport and seeing it for what it what really was. I was so proud to be Australian. It was it was amazing. Four years earlier in Atlanta, it was not a great games and um, really not done very well at all. So knowing that the games were going to be in Sydney, you know, I'm very determined that we were going to put on a bloody good show. There was a great educational process through the schools. The schools came in droves to the Paralympics, which was unbelievable and if you were in the stadium because you know it never sold out there was 110,000 seats and you were there in a morning session when there's a you know a few different schools there and it was deafening but it was absolutely brilliant and those kids come up to me today and yes it makes me feel old they're in their 20s and 30s but um <laughs> saying that they you know came to the games and experienced it and I'm like what an unbelievable experience to have for me I, you know I'm totally biased but I do think that um, Sydney did a great job in terms of how the Paralympics should be and how it should be represented and moving forward and the respect that the athletes should have Yeah, because even marketing of the Paralympics has really come above and beyond. Most significantly, London 2012 Paralympic, even the pre-Paralympic videos, everything around it. it. It was interesting to see the fusion of sport, strength, and then the actual vulnerability of the situation that got them there in the first place. And I think that's a really good mix of all the realities. It was great. I think London did an amazing job, took it to another level again. Like they had different channels that covered both the Olympics and Paralympics. And I remember the advertising for Channel 4 in the UK and just being like, oh, okay, good. Now the warm up events happened. Now we can get onto the real thing. And that was just mind blowing. It was so good. It was just awesome to see. They did take it to another level. And it's just, I think it's continued on, which is phenomenal. I mean, the first Paralympics in Australia to get any television coverage was 92. And it's kind of gone on from there. And then the first commercial coverage was in Rio. So it, it's gone on. And, and again, this time we're going to have um, commercial coverage um, with the seven networks. So um, yeah, it's it's a different event. It's, it's just as exciting. The sport is so, so competitive. And yeah, there's some great characters out there. But yeah, there's, there's, there's so many different classifications, different disability groups that are represented at the Paralympics. And it, yeah, it makes it extremely interesting um, to watch and try and understand the different classifications. But yeah, I mean, that's something that they do on obviously the commentary, but also you know, just the, the Paralympics in general just makes it more interesting. How, you know, a basketball team performs and makes it equal on the court. And same with the rugby boys and girls, I should say. There is a girl in our rugby team, which is fantastic. Makes it very interesting and, and different to watch. It's actually really educational. Absolutely. There's a lot that can be said for what you can actually learn about people's disabilities just by making sure that it's promoted. Yeah, and explained in the right way, I suppose, as well. You know, this person is a leg amputee. It is above knee or below knee. And this is how they participate in their sport. And this is how their classification is um, relevant to them. And that's why they compete against someone else who has this impairment. So it, it, the classification is all based on functional ability. That's how they try and make it even for everybody. It is debatable a lot about the classifications and it's a very difficult thing to do. I will never you know, say it's easy and an and easy thing to do. So yeah, definitely hard work. You mentioned before all the equipment that you need to bring with you to a Paralympic Games. And how big is the Australian Paralympic team? Um, the total team is, I'd say, in excess of 250 or so, but that's including staff as well. But it's a, it's a lot of people. <laughs> it's a lot of people with a lot of equipment yes. heading over to a Games. Logistical uh, nightmare. Your life as a Paralympian going to world championships, flying around the world, um, bringing all your equipment with you, not just, you know, a, a, a luggage bag with some clothes. How has... Has that changed at all? Like has, I guess, airlines... Oh, that's a massive can of worms there. Um, airlines, I think, uh, you know, I'm always kind of ready for a, a fight, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it does get very frustrating. Yeah, it's, it makes it very difficult sometimes travelling around the world um, with a lot of equipment, um, sporting equipment. You know, what's the clarification between sporting equipment and obviously my everyday chair that I need just to get around and... Um, 
I think almost every time you get on a plane, you kind of say goodbye to your, your everyday chair and, and hope for the best. A lot of airlines don't respect the actual necessity of that piece of equipment for you and does get damaged, it does, does get thrown around and things like that, which is very frustrating. And it's not like I can get to wherever my destination is and, and just get a new one. All these chairs are very extremely custom and you're pretty much screwed if you get to the other end and you don't have your, um, they don't seem to recognise that you know, an airline wheelchair in an airport is just as good. It's not adequate at all. Um, so yeah, it, it does get very frustrating dealing with different airlines, but I am going to give them a, a positive positivity to say that they have improved and depending on what country you go to and you know what different policies are and different airlines have different disability policies as well a lot of the budget airlines are probably not the greatest for for people with disabilities and being able to travel on them unfortunately and saying that a lot of other airlines are fantastic but I think it's always good to to talk to someone who does travel a fair bit who's got a similar disability to yourself or or what the go is and know what your rights are as well I personally will only take my own chair to the to the gate and if they tell you anything different um uh, I'll probably argue, but that's just me and I've travelled too much. <laughs> but I think it's good to know what to expect and um, what your rights are, you know, and, and to be, I suppose, handled in the right way and to be respectful as well. It's very frustrating. Um, I know for myself and other people that use chairs, um, I can't speak for other disability groups, but, but to be at a counter and, and have an able-bodied person spoken to when you're right there and they're asking you about you and I'm like seriously I'm right here I can communicate quite well you know given that I do sit down Louise don't you know just sitting down can't answer that question no I know I can't answer for myself or communicate <laughs> very well but um and that's probably one of the biggest things with airlines it's quite amazing to, to think we we're at this day and age sometimes. It still happens, unfortunately. And, you know, I, I don't want to be too negative. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there that are fantastic and do see you as a person. Knowing what I know, yeah, it's with airlines and travel, then uh, I can probably tell them what the go is half the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I've only flown a handful of times getting on that, that aisle wheelchair is quite something. Yeah, it's not the most comfortable <laughs> thing in the world. It does get very frustrating that I, that I need to yeah. rely on somebody else. Um, I'm an extremely independent person, so giving up my, the right to be able to move around to do anything independently is, is probably one of the hardest things for me. I hate it. <laughs> From an accessibility point of view, and you've obviously, you've travelled the world, what is the most accessible country or what are the most accessible countries that you've visited and how are they markedly different from um, other experiences? I think the first time I ever went to the United States, um, I was a little bit blown away by their accessibility, but also probably their laws. Um, it is quite strict on their laws about having access and also accessible bathrooms and things like that. and. Um, there's a, a lot of other things that are, are quite unique to that country. Um, I think Australia is getting there. There, you know, there's a lot of changes and a lot of things are a lot better. I'll, obviously, I live in one of the biggest cities in Australia, so um, I have a lot of options, and probably that's why I do live in one of the biggest cities. I also think Australia's laws probably aren't as strict, um, and we seem to get away with just the minimum. And you know, we have one wheelchair spot, we have one this, one that, and that's all they're required to do. And it makes it very frustrating for people. And I, you know, I'm part of that group, I suppose, which gets very frustrated at times about certain things and how you have to go about certain ways of doing stuff. So yeah, I mean, heaven forbid you go out with someone else in a chair, or you have more than one friend that requires you know, a, a wheelchair accessible spot at a concert or something like that and you can't sit with more than one able-bodied person. Heaven forbid we have more than one friend um, <laughs> or a carer for that matter, you know. So it, it does get very frustrating the, the way they, they do set up things and, and have restrictions on, on many things. I think it also goes with the age of the country too. A lot of places in Europe, are, it's very hard for them to make things accessible because, you know, a lot of things are either heritage or it, it's just not possible in the building and the concept that was designed a bazillion years ago. So you've got to pick and choose, I suppose. But things are definitely getting better. I, I, I want to be positive. So what, what countries do you recommend accessibility wise if I if I'm going to go traveling whenever that might be like in 45 years um <laughs> <laughs> we're very allowed to leave yeah if we're allowed to leave uh what what um what countries do you recommend uh 
manual wheelchair users, for example. Really plan for it and um, talk to different people. There's specific travel agents that deal with being able to make your trip very smooth and, and trying to, to book everything and plan ahead. Then I think you could almost go anywhere and, and make it happen. And I, I think I live for the you know, the adventure and trying to make it happen and, and see things that you probably, you know, aren't the most accessible. I remember going to the Great Wall of China and thinking, I'm coming here just once in my whole life, so let's make this happen, take lots of photos, and I probably won't ever come back because <laughs> it wasn't the most accessible place in the world, but we made it happen. <laughs> Tell me about the transition from Paralympian to Paralympic coach. When you look at the people you're training now, like obviously comparing it to your time and things are obviously different now but um, what has it been like to be a coach for the Australian Paralympic team as somebody who's been a former athlete? Yeah it's it's great I mean I didn't know if I was going to be any good at a, at a coach at being a coach or you know um, I thought I'd have a go I you know I wanted to, to stay involved in my chosen sports so I did prepare for it and to, to see whether I could do it um, but yeah it, it's I love my sport more than anything and to still be involved at this level is such a reward and um, I'm, you know, pinch myself sometimes um, and other times I pinch myself for other reason. Why are you doing this? <laughs> um, but um, it's definitely a challenge. It's, it's very different. Um, I obviously had a lot of success as an athlete. It was fantastic and I loved it. But now being part of someone else's journey and helping them achieve their dreams and goals and being part of that with them is even more rewarding. So it's fantastic. And we often talk about our communicational level, um, but because I was an ex-athlete, you know, I can get out there and I, I know how they're feeling. I know what it's like. I know what it's like doing exactly what they're doing and the stress and the pressure and what they're going through. And they know that. And they don't, you know, they, they look at me and I can look at them and they know that I know how they're feeling and I can almost anticipate what they might, might need um, at that time. So um, it's a different communication level I think I have with the athletes a little bit in that respect, which is fantastic. Speaking of being an athlete, I don't think, I mean, especially me, because I asked you like 400 questions last week, but what is the training that actually has you have to go through to be um, an athlete in your sport? My, me personally, I obviously did a lot of work, uh, a lot of training sessions. Uh, Madison is in the race chair six days a week. He has only one day out of the chair. She does a number of sessions in the gym between two and three sessions in the gym. And she does, um, I used to do a lot more cross training as well, um, as well. But there's so many other things, you know, the recovery process, there's so many other components that, that make an athlete these days. As we have um, a massive team around us, um, not including myself as the coach, but I, you know, I have a, a physiologist, I have a biomechanist, a nutritionist, sports psychologist. We have um, so many different people that contribute to our program, you know, strength and conditioning coaches, they all um, have input into the program and making that athlete be the best they possibly can. And, you know, I'm the kind of coach that goes to all these experts in their fields and says, okay, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to achieve. What can you do to help me get that athlete there? How can you contribute? I'm, you know, I'm not expected to know all these different specialities. It's a, it's a fantastic team effort. And then, you know, obviously yourself would see the athlete just get out on the track and do their thing. But to know what's gone on behind the scenes to get them to that, to that point is just phenomenal. Um, yeah, you can appreciate it definitely. <laughs> We're doing a lot of um, heat work at the moment because obviously Tokyo is going to be extremely warm and coming out of, you know, Australia's winter, not that it's, you know, snowing or anything like that, but um, it's still a lot colder and not as humid as what we're going to go into and not being able to travel anywhere prior to the games this time. Um, we have done a lot of work in the, in the in the climate chamber, so training in that, but also top up uh, passive um, heat work as well. So, yeah, just trying to get her acclimatised as best we can. So, you know, she gets over there and it's not a massive shock to her body or to her personally. She knows what to expect. Paralympics aside, or championships aside, but kind of related. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Stella Young, who um, did a TED Talk uh, that went viral about uh, not being your inspiration, talked about... She's awesome. I've She's, watched that. <laughs> I've watched it so many times, right? And she talks about people's perceptions of disability and how the disability is automatically inspirational. 
doesn't really matter what it is about you. The disability itself is already inspirational. Now, you come from a background which <laughs> is unusual in the, in the respect that you have been the inspiration for a lot of para-athletes in so many ways. But what do you actually think about these kinds of terms and, uh, I don't know, the messaging? I am 100% with Stella. <laughs> um, no, she said it so well. And, yeah, to be that eloquent and to talk about it the way she did was fantastic. And uh, it's a shame she's no longer there with us now. Um, but yeah, that'll live on. It's just, yeah, I find it really hard. Um, you know, people obviously see you inspirational because you have a disability and, oh, wow, you're going to the shops and doing your own shopping. Um, I pump petrol into my car. Um, these are not inspirational things. These are everyday things that everybody does. And I don't find that inspirational, but a, a lot of people do, unfortunately. And people use those words and those terminologies for I think everyday things but they also it's associated as you said with disability regardless oh, it yeah frustrates me it does frustrate me a lot um I find it really cool and you separated them just now with regards to um inspiring other athletes that for me is perfect if I can inspire another athlete or another person with a disability to get out there and participate or have a go or come along and just enjoy sport or, or even going for a walk with a friend or anything like that. I think that is what I want to be the inspiration for. I think we've talked about this before. If you can see it, you can be it. And the more exposure and the more people are seen, then I think that's inspiring other people to get out there and do things and to be whatever they want. It doesn't have to be sport involved. Seeing, you know, one of the first quadriplegics become a doctor in Australia, and there's a number of them now, another of, number of different people with disabilities in lots of different professions. But if you can see people doing that and the exposures out there, then I think that's the inspiration that I want to see, not me going to the shops and doing my shopping or pumping petrol in my car or, um, everyday life, you know, living independently, imagine that. Um, <laughs> so for me, that's not inspirational. Um, for me, inspiration is, is inspiring someone else to, to, to be something, do something. Um, and it's the same for everybody. I mean, I think um, little kids, you know, see different professions, different people and think, oh, wow, I want to be able to do that when I grow up kind of thing. So I think it's the same for us, exactly the same. Yeah, because uh, we've spoken about Charles Bryce, the journalist for the ABC. I, they film torso up, um, so you don't even know. No, you know, I was absolutely unless you really. Pick yeah, it. <laughs> I mean, um, I can pick it because I know, you know, obviously I interact with a lot of people with disabilities, but um, I could see that he was he's a quad, and the way he sat or his hands that purpose came into into view a little bit or anything like that, I saw, and I'm like, wow, he's a quad. That's so cool, but general public wouldn't know that and that's fantastic that they don't know that and that he's just fulfilling a job and being part of you know our community just like everybody else. That's right and I think it also is a testament to the types of businesses that are um, not willing to take on but have decided yes we want to include everyone yeah and he talks about things that I think sometimes there's a there's a onus uh, there could be people who only want to talk about their disability all the time. In Charles's case, he talks about issues in rural and regional communities uh, for Landline, and it's universal. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You know? Yeah. <laughs> he's a journalist, um, and that's what he's doing. He's doing his job. Do you have any thoughts about what what more we we should be doing to try and, I guess, curb this sort of inspirational messaging that goes in the wrong direction? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, I think sometimes it's a generational thing as well. Unfortunately, an older generation, and I don't mean to put them down sometimes, but that's how they see people with disabilities sometimes. And I suppose it's it's changing with, and even from like myself going to a school and being the only kid with a disability, and more people with disabilities in employment opportunities um, and seeing people for their abilities, not, not their disability. The contribution that people can make in different, you know, workplaces, communities um, is phenomenal. You just need to give, be given a chance. And maybe you do need a bit of adaptive equipment or maybe you do need to make it just a tiny bit different. 
But that small difference or small change overwhelms what you can contribute. Um, but people just need to be able to se- to be given that opportunity. I think that's the more. I think people need to think way more broadly about it. Enhancing that diversity and representation that eventually we're going to get to a stage in society where you're going to see somebody who has a disability and you won't be like, that person has a disability. Yeah, or oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, I would love, I mean, it's my whole thing I'd really like to see, for people to see people for people. Um, unfortunately, there is quite a, a negative stigma around disability um, and it's, it's something very difficult to, to change. Um, how do you see the positive in that when, you know, a majority of people are, um, don't have a disability? So it's, it's very difficult. Like I'm always trying to fit into a world that's not built for me and you would know the same. Um, and you're adapting to different things that, that other people have put in place. It, it, it does become very difficult, but I, I think, you know, if you can see the person for the person, um, apart from, you know, whatever their disability is. Um, you know, I have friends that do that sometimes to the extent where they shouldn't, <laughs> where, you know, we'll get in the car and they might put my chair in for me and then we'll get out the car and they'll forget to get that chair and I'll still be sitting there and they'll be like, well, come on. And I'm like, uh, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and, you know, I have friends now that we're going out in a group and, They'll think ahead and, oh, we're going to go to this venue. I've checked it out for you. And I'm like, wow, that is fantastic. You know, I haven't had to do the work. And they have thought, no, no, you're part of us. You know, I want to go where you can go and where everyone can be the same. And, you know, they'll even avoid places that aren't accessible because they don't want to support that. And I'm like, wow, that is insanely fantastic. So um, I do think things change. Um. I've actually asked all my questions now. <laughs> but is there anything you, you want to add? We've been talking quite a lot about your journey being inspiration porn for millions of people. <laughs> is, there any, is there anything else you want to add? That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> not sure I've been told that before. <laughs> I just think that, um, yeah, I think education is the key. Um, and exposure, as we've, as we've mentioned before, education about different disabilities, but also um, not becoming the norm. Um, we live in such a diverse community. I mean, I do in Sydney, um, so many different people from different countries and, and backgrounds, and I actually love it. Um, I love learning about different people and their, their histories and their, their backgrounds and, and um, how they go about different things and their, their different beliefs. I think it's great. I, it's so diverse and I couldn't imagine a world where I was very, um, in, in a world where it was very, I suppose, stagnated and, and not evolving and changing all the time. So for me, um, I, I think the education and exposure is the, the key to, to making everyone, you know, accept anybody with a difference. You know, seeing people for who they are. So that's, that would be my ultimate to, to see that happen in Australia. And yeah, ask, ask me questions, don't assume. <laughs> um, and then Louise, maybe one day I won't have to sit outside a car park watching it um waiting for you to come by so we can go on a wheel to make sure that you get the car park (laughs) oh that's happened so many times maybe that day will come who knows thank you very much louise this was excellent (laughs) no problem thank you for having me and yeah i appreciate it you've been listening to have the nerve a podcast by spinal cord injuries australia If you're listening to this on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please consider giving us a five-star review. Your review will help us get the word out there. We're also on social media. You can find Spinal Cord Injuries Australia on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thank you for listening.